Polarization feels like either being too scared to say anything or being angry all the time. For me, polarization is a decrease in trust and respect for the other. Why would I want to work with someone who is on the opposite side of the political spectrum from me? I get deeply worried about polarization when I see people starting to neglect those very things that have kept them together for so long. What's it going to take to bring us together when it feels like so much is pulling us apart? Welcome to Breakthroughs, a podcast by Search for Common Ground, the world's largest peace-building organization. In this show, we reveal the secret to solving tough problems by building collaboration. I'm Lena Slackmulder, and for the last 30 years, I've been working on the front lines of violent conflict. I've seen enemies become allies and overcome their greatest challenges together. In this first season of Breakthroughs, we're biting off a big problem we see pretty much everywhere, polarization. So let's get going. I mean, societies are inherently polarized, but I think the more degree and intensity of polarization it is there in the society, the likelihood of any triggers, whether internal or external, mobilizing people to attack other groups, the likelihood becomes higher. That's Rajendra Mulmi, the regional director for Asia from Search for Common Ground. Originally from Nepal, he's been working across Asia and Africa for the last 15 years with divided communities, helping them to see their commonalities and reduce polarization. When we talk about polarization, we describe it really negatively. It seems that there's something normal about being polarized, but is it because we get very emotional in this state of polarization or or what is it that's perhaps concerning about polarization? It is true that there is a certain degree of normalcy with the polarization. There are different people with different beliefs. So to some extent, polarization is good and it also kind of fuels into the healthy society. But when they become very stuck in their own bubble and then get offended by anything that is not aligned with what they already believe, that brings out anger, frustrations or violence because they feel that anything that is different is inherently against us. That's where our societies are at the risk of those polarizations becoming drivers of violent conflict. A lot of people like to blame social media as causing polarization. Is it really that simple, Raj? I don't think that social media is the cause behind polarization, but a tool that is helping exacerbate it because social media has been the source of many different things for people from getting the news and facts to their social interactions. So that way, their window to the world becomes so narrow, they don't see anything that is different than what they want to believe. So when we think as peace builders looking to understand how likely it is that a violent conflict is going to break out, why do we measure polarization? I mean, societies are inherently polarized, but I think the more degree and intensity of polarization it is there in the society, the likelihood of any triggers, whether internal or external, mobilizing people to attack other groups, the likelihood becomes higher. We've seen that either ethnic, religious, political clashes and fights. That is why as peace builders, it is extremely important to track the degree of polarization in the society as we promote the aims of creating just and peaceful societies. I hear you saying that when people are polarized, like a trigger might lead them to violence. Why is that? One is the degree of insecurity. When people are polarized, there is the group that they don't align with. They would seem as a natural threat. The other is also competition. When you want the kind of thinking or the values or the things that you rally behind, then you fight, you compete, and you want to establish them. So that kind of motivation pushes a polarized society to take up violence much more easily. Why do we pay so much attention to how polarized the communities are? Why don't we just tackle the conflict and fix the problem? It's not that easy. I'm remembering my time in Nigeria where there have been like generations of conflict between the farmers 
who have a sedentary lifestyle and are settled and then herders you know who are mobile and and they move from one place to the other and then every year there are hundreds of people die people's houses get burned cattle get killed because there is both an element of competition over resources and then a sense of fear and insecurity of the other whenever we have been able to bring these two groups whether in kind of a formal dialogue process or just on a kind of a cultural afternoon for them to see each other in a different light a lot of their stereotypes the fear kind of breaks down and they are able to relate to the other see the challenges and issues that have been in many years in the pending have been resolved through these interactions You're listening to Breakthroughs, a podcast about using collaboration to solve some of our toughest problems. For many of us when we think of polarization, we think of political parties who can't get along. Or even worse than that, we see political parties dehumanizing members of their opposing parties and using fears to rally support. A lot of times this gets worse when there are already divides in that society, maybe around religion or ethnicity or race. And when this happens, we call it political polarization. As peace builders, we know that when this political polarization grows, it can create a perception that violence is justified. That means that people will support or even use violence to pursue their political party's goals. That's why what we're going to hear about now is so interesting. It's a story from Burundi, a small landlocked country in Central Africa, bordering Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has known generations of mass violence. But today we're going to hear about how a team of peace builders in Burundi acted to actually decrease that political polarization. They worked with political leaders, which sometimes some of us feel are a bit too difficult to work with because they seem to profit from this polarization at times. But instead, as we'll hear, the political leaders realize that in fact they faced similar challenges and over this process they shifted away from seeing each other purely as enemies to building alliances. I'm joined by my colleague Sabrina Bigirimana, who has worked at Search for Common Ground in Burundi since 2012 and has supported a variety of peacebuilding work there over the years. Sabrina, welcome. Thank you, Lena. It's my pleasure. So Sabrina Burundi is a country that was colonized by Belgium and since its independence in 1962 has faced waves of mass inter-ethnic violence leading to more than 300,000 deaths in the 70s and then in the 90s. Given all of that, what does polarization look like to you in Burundi? Burundi has had a really violent past. That means there are deep divides across the society between ethnic groups across the regions between the capital city and the rest of the country so this shows up uh, directly in how people engaged in politics i can say the political parties identify with specific groups and they mobilize their supporters and to see themselves as the enemy of the other political parties or the opposition parties in the end i have seen my life more times when members of political parties have used violence against supporters or leaders of other political parties that how i see the polarization in my country rather than focusing on trying to solve some of the huge problems of burundi together like poverty violence against women or trade or can i say unemployment etc uh, people are politically active focus i mean people who are politically active focus their efforts on simply trying to harm the other political parties or opposition parties that's why we came up with this idea called inamen which is kirundi for indivisible So I like that name the indivisibles it sort of sounds like you're creating a group of superheroes but this project happened about 10 years ago in the run up to what ended up being a really really turbulent period in 2015 when the Burundian president decided to stand for a third term when many felt that this was unconstitutional so what were you trying to do with the indivisibles 
Honestly, it was a pretty audacious idea, in fact. As you said, political leaders in my country were really hard line. It's not evident that they even participated in the kind of those activities we, we were organizing. We knew that young people, for example, were the first to suffer to the consequences of this manipulation. That's why we, we reached out to young people within these political parties. We knew also that they were active, but whenever we spoke to them, we also knew that they were not completely happy inside their parties and their ambitions. Or maybe their hopes were, you know, strong enough for them to say yes to what we were offering. And what was it that you were offering? What can I say? First of all, a space of dialogue, a space to see other young people from different political parties, to see them as human, first of all. And second, we create this space. We, we started slowly, not just jumping it into the most polarization issues that the political parties were fighting about. For example, the first day, one political party, the second, the other one, and at the third day, we get them to sit together. We use this strategy during um, reflection sessions. Another thing, we offer them trainings as equals to give them a fresh perspective on how they saw uh, young people's role in building a peaceful and prosperous build, uh, Burundi. And when we did that, we facilitated dialogue sessions. We saw them noticing that they had more common ground between them than they thought. So is that process what you call reducing polarization? Yes, exactly. They began to realize that they had shared aspirations, even despite being members of opposing political parties. They even realized that they had a lot in common that they couldn't even imagine. And the more we built trust, we also saw them sharing experiences on both sides. You know, how they felt that they were being manipulated, often by their own political leaders, they become more aware of how they were being encouraged to support or act or justify using violence. But we do this work, we knew what we wanted to measure, specifically whether or not the young political leaders, after being a part of Inhamenwa, were more ready to reject political violence. An external evaluation conducted in 2016 showed that 89% of youth leaders who participated in the project felt more confident to identify and avoid political manipulation that lead to violence. And 78% of these leaders shared a commitment to resist all cause of violence. That's it for this episode of Breakthroughs, a podcast by Search for Common Ground, the world's largest peace-building organization. Find out more at sfcg.org and follow us on Twitter at sfcg underscore. Thanks for coming along and hope you can join us next time. Mm-hmm.